Hey everybody, this is Brian McDonald from On Purpose Growth and uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, podcast on Seize Your Business. Uh, today we have Tony Reyes from uh, Walton uh, Contractors and uh, I'll let him to kind of describe uh, what's under that umbrella because uh, what we're gonna talk about is how you can get your business on the Inc. 5000 and not only uh, what Tony's gonna uh, explain is how to get it on the Inc. 5000, he's gonna explain how to get it uh, up to a high number just like he has uh, as 197. So there are only 190 other six businesses in this country that are on that list that are growing as uh, as fast as Tony. Uh, and I'll let him uh, give a quick introduction we'll dive right in. Brian, thanks for having me here. Thanks, uh, as Brian mentioned, I'm, I'm the managing partner of Walton Contractors. We're a value-add construction company. And I'll explain a little bit more of what that means, but I just want to apologize in advance uh, for any listeners who, uh, I'm a little rough around the edges, so uh, <laughs> I'll ask for your forgiveness up front, but I'm happy to be here. Thanks for coming out, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to have you here because your story is uh, is phenomenal. The uh, Everything that you got to share, uh, we could probably do this for a couple hours, and we're going to try to keep this to just about 30 minutes, if you will. So, um, so, uh, I mean, tell us your story. What 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 got you from from uh, your past experiences to uh, 197 on the uh, Inc. 5000? Oh man, I'll be brief. So I guess I'll, I'll start right at the beginning. So I was born and raised in Oak Park, all right, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, just right outside the city limits. Um, uh, my family um, going to high school there, at OPRF. You know, my parents owned a small business. Uh, mm-hmm. They did uh, exterior construction. And I always wanted to be uh, an architect because I grew up around mm-hmm. construction. I saw my dad uh, do different kinds of projects that really made intrigued me. And I, I realized that I wanted to build stuff, you know, on yep. a cool level. And uh, as I graduated at the end of my junior year, um, you know, I, I did pretty well in high school. I realized, uh, well, I, I got accepted into a private college downtown mm-hmm. um, for, art, uh, for studying architecture. And my parents made just enough money to not qualify for financial aid, oh, yeah. but not enough money to actually put me through this $37,000 a year school. Oh. So I was like, oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. Uh, but I always wanted to be in the Marine Corps. I always wanted to serve my country, and I decided to enlist in the Marine Corps so that I can use uh, the GI benefits of getting my school paid for oh, when God. I got out. Yeah. So I joined the Marine Corps, uh, four years turned into eight years, and all the while, uh, uh, g- uh, g- uh, my first mentor, good old Uncle Rick, was sending me all <laughs> kinds of uh, real estate books, you know, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, E-Myth, you know, Ogmandino's the greatest salesman in the world. Oh, I mean, yeah. just really just injecting this entrepreneurial spirit in me. And I, I kind of started discovering that I had some potential. And uh, so instead of enlisting uh, for my third term, which would have put me at 12 years, and most people who join at 12 years, they stay in for 20, oh, yeah. uh, I decided to get out and pursue, uh, you know, my desires of, uh, you know, doing some kind of development and building. So I got out of the Marine Corps uh, after eight years, um, married with a child on the way, and no college degree. So I, I, I joined my, uh, a family member of mine who has started um, a construction sales business and I did surprisingly well, you know, I did very, very well. And I think it was just the foundation of all that knowledge that I had picked up and just yep. really applying the things that I had learned that, you know, like uh, business savvy, you know, dealing, you know, how to meet friends, uh, win friends and influence people. Yep. Yep. Well, that's not really applicable in the Marine Corps, right? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> you're doing the opposite, right? Exactly. Yeah. Dude. You're not winning friends. And <laughs> you're not influencing people in the right no, way. No, 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 no. So to make a long story short, I, I got out and I made six figures in my first year, which is pretty awesome. And because of everything that I had learned, I wanted to parlay my money into a different business venture. Uh, so um, at the time, it was right after the recession, really. You know that you know things were you know still pretty bad. There yeah. was no consumer confidence, and in in my family, um, my my mother in law had had a cleaning business, and all these women would come like day after day saying, "Hey, please give me a job. I don't have any work." They fired me. They fired me. So I saw an opportunity in the marketplace right. because there was this this uh, uh, it was a, a workforce of people who didn't have uh, work. Right. Yeah. Right. So I said, "Wow. Like, what if I can create?" Uh, a business uh, based on this demand for jobs in the cleaning services. And, and so in there was born my first organic, uh, you know, green cleaning company, if you will. Okay. Which we launched on Groupon. Uh, oh wow! In a very ambitious way. Uh, that that was uh, that was quite the learning experience. It was my first business, and we sold ninety-seven thousand dollars worth of business in like forty-eight hours. You know. What? Um, yeah, my <laughs> wife and I were at my brother's wedding in Florida. We're taking phone calls in the hotel room. We didn't have any employees. We didn't have any like business at that point, and we yeah. just started getting this this influx of different uh, business. And you know, I made all the 
every decision, you know, textbook that you can make wrong as a business owner, I made all those yeah, in the yeah, first right. business, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and I, you know, just as fast as I went up, I came down, you know? Yeah, right. So I, uh, I, I picked up the pieces, you know, we dissolved that corporation and we were just trying to figure out how do we make this work again, you know? And we did, we, we, we built the right systems in place. Um, we became very profitable. We were cleaning homes like in Burridge, Hinsdale, like Naperville, those kinds of oh, neighborhoods, yeah. more affluent. And what we did is we just took the opportunity was there. We dressed it up in a very clean way, uh, offer, offering things that uh, consumers wanted, which was a, you know organic cleaning. They wanted to deal with a company. They wanted a paperless company. All our cars were Priuses, you know, we had like uh, yeah, okay. recyclable material. So everything that was kind of like in, uh, appropriate for what, you know, the demographic that we were trying to reach is what we were trying to do. So. Um, then from there, we got a loan to open a commercial cleaning franchise, you know, and we were servicing like bigger jobs. And then finally, I had the opportunity to, you know, to build a bridge to what I wanted to do personally, which is, uh, you know, build homes, you know, real estate, you know, construction. Okay. And uh, as I got my foot in the door, uh, we built uh, what we now call Walton Contractors, right, which is my company that was uh, featured on Inc. 500. And it was really, uh, it was my heart's desire to be involved in real estate development. I had bought uh, you know, a few buy and hold real estates. I was trying to get involved in like uh, what they call flipping, if you will. Yep. And I just wanted to do that because it just it, it was pulling on my heartstrings of of you know of uh, creating you know adaptive reuse, doing something that was in purpose for what it is and making it more reusable, making it open concept, you know, kind of like the look and the feel and the relationships. That was all what I really wanted to be involved in. Uh, so we started up Walton Contractors and we sold the other two cleaning companies. Um, you know, both the commercial and the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the private one. And uh, we started about three and a half years ago. It's going to be four years come January that we're oh, at Walton wow, congrats, Contractors. Man. That's Thanks. great. <laughs> uh, so Walton Contractors right now focuses on um, value-add construction. And what I mean by that is that we really work in the bubble of real estate. You know, what's real estate? So we you wouldn't call me to fix your bathroom or redo your basement. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, primarily, we work with um, medium-sized developers who do what we call adaptive reuse. Like, for example, we just finished a 68-unit adaptive reuse property uh, in downtown Chicago on Michigan oh, Avenue. Wow. Oh, and geez. what they took is this old Studebaker building that used to sell cars, the old Studebaker cars. Oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Remember those? And they made it, and they made it into apartments, you know? Uh, and we did 64 units in Pilsen. Again, you know, properties that only had like six units, they turned it into 12, right? So it's really creative, yeah, you know, right. really finding yeah. ways to, you know, turn that real estate the same square footage yet add more rental, which obviously you and I both know directly impacts the value of that yeah, property, right? Yep. Uh, so that's more on a commercial level. On a more residential level, we do a lot of new construction. Uh, we build brand new homes. We do additions. Uh, again, in that area, we work with hard money lenders, uh, boutique investors. Uh, you know, people who do one or two a year, some of them do 80 a year, mm-hmm. uh, doing uh, flips for them and helping them be a sounding board for their real estate projects. And, then, and so we're pretty well diversified within construction. Yeah, it sounds you know? like it. Um, and, and then we also do storm restoration. We work with insurance agents who do, you know, uh, we help them with the, their clients' flood damage whenever it floods. Uh, we work with uh, public adjusters and insurance companies. We work with uh, general construction doing church work and stuff like that, um, which is which is really strategic. You know, we right. wanted to, f- figure out a way to diversify ourselves uh, to the real estate ups and downs as well as, uh, you know, storm related stuff, you know? So in a nutshell, that's what we, that's yeah. my company does. So, uh, so it sounds like um, you're very unique inside the uh, real estate space. Mm-hmm. Um, was that a different appo- uh, approach than you took to the cleaning business, like based on things that you learned where you wanted to look a certain way or help me understand, because it sounds like you know, you got rid of those uh, cleaning businesses for a reason and became something different. Correct. Um, so help me understand man, that process. That's a great question, man. And the biggest, I guess the, the, the quickest answer is that I didn't have what you call a moat around my business. And the moat, okay. a moat is in the medieval term, you know, they would build a castle and they would figure out a way uh, for, for them to control uh, ways that they're being attacked. So, yeah, right. you know, on, on a mountain or maybe around a river. And what would happen was I had one time an employee steal like 12 homes for me, right? And so it was, uh, you know, steal the contracts, if you will, you know. Uh, so she started, or he or she just started She offered her them. services to my client. She's like, hey, I'll clean it for a fraction of the price. Ah, uh, okay. You know, so she essentially stole uh, our yeah. contracts, right? right? Which is a conflict of interest. That happened one time. And then it happened another time, not 12 homes, but, it, you know, because at one point we had like 109 homes that we were servicing on a oh monthly basis. And we had someone else steal like uh, three homes. And I realized that, wow, like, this is gonna be a tension, like meaning it's a problem because I will never be able to solve it really, you know? Yeah, right. And I, I figured I need to figure out a way to be in business where I can build a moat, where I can prevent my employees or even subcontractors from taking from me. So I had to kind of, you know, 
I don't want to say put myself on the platform, but I had to figure out a way to you know have a competitive advantage that my employees and or subcontractors or even com- competition, actual competition, yeah, right. wouldn't have. And I felt that with uh, construction in general, like doing new construction or even doing commercial development, I had that because uh, a- a- in my foundation, I was a real estate investor. You know, like I, I-, I loved real estate. I understood it. I-, I could speak the language, if you will. And I knew that's something that was going to be very, very difficult for them to duplicate, to not just steal internally, but also steal from my competition. A lot of my competition, they don't have... Um, they don't have they, they don't know the ins and outs of real estate finance, if you will. They oh, might know yeah, how yeah. to do construction well. So if I can deliver that value to my clients and say, hey, you know what, I'm not just a general contract for you. I could be a sounding board in dealing with your banker, in mm-hmm. dealing with your investors and doing the walkthroughs and, and kind of make sure making sure that I'm adding a different kind of value to them, I knew that I would be able to retain clients. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so uh, cleaning is, uh, that's why I transitioned, the main reason why I transitioned out of cleaning. But yes, a lot of the lessons that I learned there was very important. You know, like branding is very important in cleaning like big time important. I know a lot of contractors don't do a lot of branding. They don't do a lot of marketing. And for me, that gives me a competitive competitive edge because I think that marketing is uh, essential to any business. You know, that's why McDonald's, as big as it is, is still branding. They're still putting, you know, billboards out and they're still on buses, you know, they're staying in your mind. So we try to do that through different outlets, mainly right now, social media, which I think we'll talk about a little bit, uh, but also through direct mail, through billboards that we have, um, you know, through different networking events, we figure out a way to keep those relationships kind of like we did in the cleaning company on the construction side. Uh, so it sounds like, uh, based on your uh, example, uh, between the way it was in the cleaning business and now too, that there was um, something you've done in the culture that uh, uh, that has helped your business grow, right? Uh, yeah. And, and not disappear. Right? Talk about that. For Man, a that's, that's a good question too because the, one of the hardest things that I had with the cleaning company is that most of these, uh, you know, most of our clients were women, obviously, right? They didn't want to deal with a man, you know, like, well, what is he, you know, I, I hate to sound sexist, but they didn't, they, they were probably thinking in their head, like, what does this guy know about cleaning? Yeah, right, right. right. They wanted to deal with a female counterpart or a colleague of mine, which which was uh, which was unfortunate, but it was very evident. I mean, it wasn't one time, it was many, many times oh, really? I, I felt like that, that there was like a... They, they were uncomfortable, you know, with, 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 with me representing cleaning or even, I don't know what it was, but I could feel that it was there. Um, so that meant that I can directly impact my client's relation, the relationship with my client. So I had to rely on different um, colleagues that I had that work with me that would be responsible for the relationship, mm-hmm. which I felt they probably didn't have the same aden- attention to detail that I would have had, you know? Yeah, right. Um, and with construction, it's the opposite. Primarily because uh, I can I can be that touch point with the con- with the with the customer. I can be there. I can do the walkthrough with them. I can deal with their, you know. Whenever you're talking about bigger construction, there's many relationships that you have to manage. You yeah. know, uh, both on the banking side, investors, just you know, hands down uh, contract. Um, clients or customers as well as subcontractors and employees as many so with that uh, I believe that one of the biggest things that uh, has helped Walton uh, be, been, uh, be so successful in such a short amount of time is that I believe that I am the company and the company is me you mm-hmm. know I think that those two are synonymous mm-hmm. especially when you're a company like mine you're a startup you're not huge you know you're not you yeah, know right. this humongous company um, I think that I it my, my employees and my contractors are never going to do more than I'm willing to do. So it's up to me to set the bar high yeah, and set the example. I need to be the first guy on the job sometimes. I need to be there. Sometimes I get hand, I get my hands dirty when it's cold. Like the other day, I went and I started unloading stuff with them to show them that, hey, I'm in the trenches with you. Yeah, you know? right, right. And you kind of gain not just um, their their respect. I, I, I think that respect is just given just because you're being an employer, but you get their loyalty. And loyalty oh, yeah. is... Uh, it, loyalty is a part of the culture that I'm not willing to sacrifice. I need my people. My, the biggest asset that I have in my um, my company is my team. Mm-hmm. You know, so I need to know that they're for me even when I'm not there. Yeah. So I think that uh, being you know, understanding that you and your company are synonymous with each other, and understanding that you have to cultivate the culture, and if you have a rotten apple, you got to cut them loose quickly. Yeah. You know, yeah, um, is very important to me because that culture will eventually duplicate itself. Whether we want to or not, it, it's going to evolve. You know, if you know if you're not growing. You're dying, right? So essentially, yep. oh, yeah, your business absolutely. is going to be growing. So if they don't carry the same DNA as the entrepreneur, or as uh, you know, or what you really want to be reflective in your company, it will grow for the worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that culture is something that's really impacted the way that we grow. We choose very carefully the people who are on our management side. We're very careful to choose subcontractors who you know are are, are 
real rough around the edges, you know? They yeah. don't, don't like to play nice, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I met those guys. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that is important to me. And I think culture is very important in any industry. Uh, so um, so what it sounds like to me is the uh, you purposely created a culture by changing, improving yourself? Correct. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, Explain absolutely. Explain that a little bit. Absolutely. Because, you know, like, um, you know, right now I'm reading this phenomenal book called uh, Capital Gains by Chip uh, Gaines, who's uh, the, sh- the, the host for Fixer Upper on okay. HGTV. Yeah, yeah. Really cool book. Oh, yeah. And he, I think he said it best, man. He, he was saying that his company uh, took off when his employees and his uh, subcontractors knew, uh, they felt how much he cared, you know? Yeah. And I think that by improving yourself, uh, you know, and becoming a better uh, person, which would make you a better entrepreneur, which would hopefully make you a better father and better husband and all those yeah, things. All around, around, right? right? Uh, you're going to treat your employees better. You're going to deliver a bigger value. You're going to treat your clients better. You're going to get better deals. Uh, so by growing as an individual, it allow- I can't I can't duplicate what I'm not, you know? I mean, well said, that, that, well that, said, I'm right? not, not just on an emotional or, or on a motivational level, but also on a physiological level. I cannot duplicate a hippopotamus. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I right. can, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You cannot duplicate what you're not. So, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I love that example. <laughs> so I think that whatever you are is what you're going to be able to grow and cultivate. Mm-hmm. You know, you cannot cultivate a culture that you're not. So, you know, and same thing. So like, it's same thing. Like we, 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 um, we are able to, you know, socialize better with people who are like-minded. You know, mm-hmm. I only want positive people on my team. I only want people who see the best in other people. Yeah, right. You know, I can treat, I can teach people skills. Like I could teach someone how to use Excel or, hey, this is the project management software. I cannot teach them attitude though. Attitude yeah. something that comes with them, you know? So when we hire people, we need to make sure that, you know, they have the right attitude, that, you know, that we'll ask them different questions to make sure that they can solve uh, problems and they're resourceful. But I don't hire someone based on skill alone because mm-hmm. skill can be taught, you know, and attitude and personality cannot, you know? Uh, so that's why that's why I talk about the importance of culture and kind of picking your team wisely. Yeah, so it sounds like to me, and I'm gonna put words in your mouth and correct me uh, if, if uh, this isn't on point, but it sounds like you feel that uh, your business is a reflection of you? You know, like if, if I'm this way, my, my business should look this way, and the, you're kind of, your you're check and balance is... Not a reflection, the same thing. They are one and the same. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. Even deeper right. than that, I think, you know? Okay, yeah. But yes, you're right. That's interesting. Um, so if, uh, if people aren't getting out of their business what they want, they gotta check to see if it's them that's causing the challenge or not. Absolutely. Right? Uh, Absolutely, you're the roots. You're the roots of the company. You are the only one who can directly impact the culture. At first, it might feel like you know it's against the grain, you know. But I think that ultimately, if you want to see, you have to like. I, I, is it Gandhi who said you have to be the change that you want to see in the world? Yes, I you know. I, I don't know if it was Gandhi, but yeah, I got. I, I'm pretty I, sure I that. that it was yeah, Gandhi, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I could be. You know, I don't want to put words in Gandhi's mouth. Yeah, right. But there you go. I think it's a phenomenal quote. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, even even uh, in marriage, you know, like uh, in my marriage counselor at the church that we go to when we were first getting married, we went through this course. Uh, it says uh, it's my responsibility to change the behavior, not change the behavior, but to be the kind of relational person behave, uh, in my behavior that I would like to see in my wife, yeah, right? right? You know, I can't start at my wife like, what's wrong with you? I have to make sure that I get her out of the rut if she's mm-hmm. having a tough day and how do I love her better, right? And I think that that goes back to us as leaders. We have to be um, servants, you know? Yeah, yeah. We have to serve our people. Our people need to know that we're for them. We can never be too big, uh, you know, to not do the little stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I try to do that. I always try to figure out a way, whenever I see an opportunity, to really prove to uh, an employee or prove to uh, one of my managers that I am for them and I'm in the trenches with them, I will absolutely like knock it out the park. I'll do whatever I have to do. That's phenomenal, man. I mean, yeah, taking ownership of all this stuff, is is. Uh, it sounds like you do a great job of that. Uh, anything else that uh, are about your journey that we didn't cover that uh... oh man I got a few things I don't know how much time we have uh, I think that the I think the biggest thing is like um, understanding that challenges and oppositions uh, will absolutely come right that's a big thing mm-hmm. um, we have had many uh, I, I call it setbacks you know okay you know setbacks you know we've had a contractor steal eighty seven thousand dollars worth of uh, uh, for a job that he was supposed to do that he did not complete or he completed very poorly and then I had to redo, redo it, it you know yeah. that hurt you know you know, that hurt and, you know, there's different challenges that we'll face 
um, you know, dealing with a company, you know, even in our short time in being in business, I think we've dealt with some pretty severe challenges. Uh, but I think that when I already knew from previous businesses that challenges would come. And in the Marine Corps, I was just speaking at a school a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. and I, I made a comment that was so true. And I said, you know, in Iraq, I served in the United States Marine Corps. I was part of what they call uh, ex- explosive ordnance disposal, meaning okay. that we would go, we would be the firemen to IEDs, roadside bombs, right? So when they went off, you we would be you the showed ones, up? Yeah, we would be the ones to be there to making sure there wasn't secondaries, you know, or there wasn't some kind of ambush. Oh, yeah, right? okay. And a lot of times, so anytime that we were doing our job, it was like 100% like, we might die. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It was like yeah. like fear, like and you're getting right with the creator and yeah, you know, right. <laughs> Tell me about all of that stuff. <laughs> and it was a lot of pressure, you know, and I think that it affected me for some time after I came back. But I made a comment and I said, I ne- when I went to Iraq, I never thought that I would ever be under pressure so much of the fear uh, or feeling like I'm going to die, you know? That's a real pressure. And then I said, until I became an entrepreneur, because it, you know, oh, really? <laughs> because dealing with entrepreneurship and dealing with budgets and, oh my God, how are we gonna get a quarter of a million dollars in the next 30 days or whatever challenges that yeah, you might have, right. sometimes those are scary, uh, those are scary feelings and there's sleepless nights and you're dealing with uh, different, you know, outside forces that are not within your control. You know, if I had a developer who didn't wanna pay me or he's behind on something and he decided to pay that instead of paying me, it's not that I did something wrong. You're dealing with a challenge that was unforeseen that wasn't part of my responsibility that's still affecting the ecosystem of my business, right? Right. So I just wanted to say, you know, that challenges will come. Uh, I think that we should take everything day by day, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, but you know, obviously, always have PMA, positive mental attitude. You know, and I like that. Uh, yeah. PMA, and and figure out a way to be resourceful and, and figure out your problems. I like uh, something that Grant Cardone says, and you'll have to excuse me because I speak very very fast, right? That's okay. Um, it's a Latino in me, and <laughs> and what what Grant Cardone says is he says that you have to have so much going on that not one single thing will disappoint you. Exactly. And I love right. that. Yeah, I love because that too. I got my hands in so many things. You know, like. We push, we push the envelope here, but like we don't all drive our headlights at the same time. Right. But we have so many things going on that even if my biggest contract were somehow to default on paying me today, my company's still gonna be open tomorrow mm-hmm. and we're gonna still push forward now. I don't want that to happen, obviously. Right. But I think that it's important to figure out a way to diversify yourself. Like for example, we're diversified within storm restoration, which is contingent on bad weather and insurance, like you know, flood claims, storm claims, things right. like that nature. I'm also doing general construction, which is really dealing with homeowners, and we're also dealing with investors that are obviously contingent on the economy, right, as it keeps going up. Um, But we always try to figure out a way to diversify ourselves and do so much or have so much things going on so that not one single thing can disappoint us. So I think it's important to, if you're concerned about something going south or you're concerned about challenges that you kind of, you know, see on the horizon here, then you need to figure out a way to diversify yourself and or have so many things going on so that one thing won't disappoint you. Yeah, that seems like a great... uh um, combination of uh, not putting all your eggs in one basket that if that one thing fails you're done Absolutely. as well as at the same time pushing the envelope so you constantly stretch yourself uh-huh. to constantly be able to do more uh-huh. beyond maybe what you thought you could actually do correct right I, I've never heard that that way and that's that was a phenomenal gelling of both of those things so um, a good hybrid right yep Another one is, um, I think entrepreneurship is, uh, or success is a responsibility, not a privilege. And what I mean by that is that a lot, a lot of time, I know a lot of entrepreneurs, you know? I mean, I know a lot of them. And a lot of times they'll be like, well, I deserve a day off, you know? Or you know what, I'm going into late uh, to work today and or leaving early. And I'm not saying that it's not okay to have some of those days, but what I'm saying is that just because you're an entrepreneur or you're successful, it, it doesn't give you the entitlement, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like the old adage goes like, entrepreneurs are the only ones who work 80 hours a week so they don't have to work 40 hours a week for someone else, right? Exactly, right, <laughs> yep. And that's how I feel, I take that I take that uh, personally. And not just on like, I need to be at work all the time, uh, but I need to be doing something that's adding value to my company yeah, every right. day. Maybe I don't work 12 hours in one day, maybe I work two, but whatever I did in that day is gonna be reflective. Somehow it's gonna turn into capital or a relationship that's gonna blossom to something better, but also community. Walton does a lot of uh, community stuff, you know, oh, for right. like, yeah, for lower income areas. We support a lot of soccer teams, a lot of football teams, like, you know, uh, American football teams. And I'm actually on the board of the Cicero Boys Club, um, the huh. vice president okay. of the board, because things like that matter to me. You right. know, uh, how do we impact the youth? You know, and I think that kind of goes back to, um, and by, oh, actually, by the time you hear this, I'll be on the board of the Spanish um, 
Coalition for Housing, right? Pasilla? Uh, no, no, no. That's uh, that's for construction. Oh, this is okay. for the inner city of Chicago for like uh, you know, programs for preventing foreclosure among uh, Latinos, um, giving them programs to actually buy uh, you know, to, for home Homes. ownership oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, right. or just you know if they're buying a, a multifamily, you know, landlording classes and kind of knowing your your rights as a landlord as well as the rights of a, a tenant, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but I think that the the biggest thing is that how, how are we paying it forward, you know? And I think that's what really brings a fulfillment. I think we've been really good about trying to figure out how we become a quote unquote hometown hero. You know, mm-hmm. how do we impact the community? And, I, and everyone's community is different. Where we all come from is different. But for me, where I come from, it's very important uh, to impact the families that are behind me, you know, that I'm doing some good and I'm not just generating capital or donating to my, I think all those things are great, right? But I think that if there isn't that spiritual essence of I am doing something for the community that I service or that I employ or, you know, things of that nature, then I think that you're, we're, we're kind of missing the mark as entrepreneurs, you know, and we're not really, uh, it's we're not taking on the responsibility of what is entrepreneurship yeah, right. and we're just looking at the privilege of it. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, you're just an entrepreneur because, hey, I'm an entrepreneur and now I'm important, right? Now Correct. you're on your, uh, <laughs> your ivory tower and everybody works for you and, and I'm just going to make a lot of money and you guys are my minions, right? It sounds like you... Uh, you approach that in a completely different way. We want to be the opposite of that. Exactly. You know, I, I want people. I want to leave. I want to leave this world in a better uh, condition than how we found or how it was given to me when I got here, right? And I think that the only way that we can really truly develop legacy is impacting lives that will be here after we're gone. You know, that's phenomenal. Um, which is really more of a life goal than anything, right? Um, I guess the other thing um, is, I think that when we started Walton. Uh-huh. We didn't start it to make money, even though money's important, right? Yeah, I think right. the biggest thing that we wanted to do is I, I, I looked at myself and I said, who do I want to become? Okay. Not who do I want to be? And that, and to answer that question just like briefly, is I want to be a, a real estate developer. I want to build skyscrapers downtown Chicago. That's my goal, you know, my dream. And so when we looked at, when I looked at who I wanted to become, I started uh, looking at like what is what is the Tony Ray is at eighty five or ninety years yeah, old? Right. What does he look like? You know, uh-huh. what does he do? You okay. know, who, what are the kind of relationships that he has? And I kind of reverse engineered from there, like okay. Well, if I want to get to there, I need to figure out a way to, you know, have a sustainable company, Mm -hmm. build these kinds of relationships, work in these types of places. And that, uh, you know, the reason why I think that it's more important who you want to become um, is because I think that who you want to become is generational, meaning that it's going to impact your children and your children's children and what you do. Uh, or what you want to do or what you would like to do is more of in our lifetime and it will Mm -hmm. die with me or die with you. And I think that, uh, you know, you know, God is a generational God, like at least the God that I believe in, and He He wants to impact my kids' kids and yep. my kids, right? And if I want to build something that's going to last, that's going to impact their lives, then I need to look at really what's my destiny. Really, mm-hmm. who who is it that I've been you know, destined to be? If yeah, you right. Will, you exactly. Know? And understanding that we have unlimited of untapped potential in our lives, you know. And I don't mean that. Uh, to sound, I don't want to say that to sound cliche. I really believe that you can only do as much as you think you can do. Exactly, you know? I believe that hundred percent as well. And you're not going to tap into that if you're not looking, you know, if you're not purposely seeking it out, you know, yeah. and developing like self help books and going to events that are kind of opening your mind and mm-hmm. growing who you are as an individual, so that you can tap into this untapped potential that we have. Right? That's interesting, man. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so uh, as we wrap this up, um, what's if you can give to all our viewers and our listeners, the uh, what's one thing that uh, you can say was the, one of the most important things in your business or the smartest thing that somebody could do right now in their business? Because you shared a lot of stuff, um, but uh, and people may be overwhelmed in a, in a really good way. Uh, <laughs> what, what's, that, what's that one thing that uh, they can take action on right now? Right on. Okay, that's that's perfect, man. Uh, social media. Social media is a great equalizer, I think, in this day and age. And, and how has that helped or made an impact in your business? Man, it's made all the difference. I think that if you go to uh, Facebook and you look up Walton Contractors and you take a look at how we have kind of um, developing a marketing uh a marketing strategy there. We have Facebook Live videos, we have production videos, we have photos, we have events, and we have, I mean, social media is such a, you know, everyone, you know, my grandma has a Facebook page, okay? Yeah, right. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Right. Like, you know, I don't even know where, like, everyone has. That's where it's become, yeah. right? That's what it's come to, right? You know, my, my grandma will be sharing some, she'll be sharing some articles with me. I'm like, oh my God. It's one o'clock at, in the morning, you know? Yeah, right, exactly. Go to sleep, grandma. But uh, it's funny because uh, we, we've done like billboards off of 1994, you know, mm-hmm. that's like Walton Contractors, or we've done a tremendous amount 
of uh, you know direct mail or even just I mean just traditional ways of marketing. We done we actually had a commercial, a thirty second commercial on uh, uh, Telemundo, which is like one, really? which is a huge network uh, in, in, for Spanish yeah. uh, people. But none of them have div- uh, delivered the results, or I have not been able to get to gather the analytics like I have on social media. I think all those are kind of like comparing a shotgun to a sharpshooter, right? Whenever you're shotgunning, whenever I put a billboard up, I'm hoping that I get capture someone who's mm-hmm. not on their phone, right? Texting, yeah, yeah, right? right? <laughs> Good point, yeah. <laughs> who's not texting and takes or on out, Facebook. Or on, on Facebook, Facebook. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and jots on my number, or same way, you know, I'm hoping that whenever I send direct mail, that they're not just jumbling it out with all the rest of the trash and just mm-hmm. throwing it away. Um, with social media, there's specific analytics, spe- uh, specifically in uh, Facebook. I can I can uh, tailor the filters to sex, to age, to interest, to geographic location. I can gauge how many people looked at every photo, every video. What times were they looking at it? What's the best time for my industry to post? It's a very specific way to do social media, and I think it kind of goes back to uh, Sun Tzu's book, uh, The Art of War. Yeah. Sun Tzu said something. He said that uh, one of his one of his um, rules was that you have to make your enemy think that you have something that you don't have. So if you're a big company, you have to appear small, and if you're a small wow. company, you have to appear very big right and i think that social media has allowed my company which i guess it would be a smaller developer company seem enormous you know yeah. like we're just beating up people with content with good content right yeah uh, right. but either way we're just saying in their face we're trying to deliver value every single day and it's unbelievable to me how many businesses have not really gotten this way because they think like well social media is not the way that we do business i'm like well you know what in the next five years it will be the only way yeah, that you right. really do business exactly, you know right uh, so I think that if you get, uh, you know, jump on the you know, the gravy train with biscuit wheels now, <laughs> you're gonna have a much further uh, track record than your uh, competition. Right. So for me, it's a competitive advantage because I don't know any general contractor who's posting the videos or doing the vlogs that we're doing or, or just the pictures. So it creates uh, uh, an ability for me to kind of um, boost and post and market you know, boost or post is what you would say on, on, on the oh, Facebook, no, Facebook side, yeah, but to right. market but, basically to people who share the same interests that my company have, you know, investors, people who are flipping homes, people who like real estate, people who have sustained some kind of storm related damage with insurances. Mm-hmm. So now the algorithm of Facebook will appear my content on their newsfeed based on their sex, age, interest, mm-hmm. and geographic location. I don't know one negative thing about social media. I think people say like, well, what's the ROI? What's the ROI on the billboard? Exactly. What's right? the ROI you, on direct mail? You how know? do you measure that, right? But yet you can measure the analytics on social media, you know? Right, right. So I, I would really encourage people to really, really get on social media before uh, it gets, it, you know, it becomes more saturated with people who do what you're specifically doing in your industry. Get ahead of the curve now, start creating content. And I think you'll see, like for us, it took us eight months to really get like big, con- uh, big momentum. And right. now the majority of the way that people reach out to me is through Facebook now. You're like, hey, I saw this article that you shared, or hey, I saw you with this guy, or I saw that video. Yeah, I would say 80% of everything we, I mean, a bit, I mean, it's a huge amount of people who reach out to us are reaching out through Facebook. And it just kind of solid, it, it, I don't think that it necessarily helped us get a deal because we were already doing things for marketing either way, but it helped us validate who we are in the marketplace. So there, you know, people are snooping around like, oh, what do they do? Yeah. Where are they at? Well, I think those two things are, are, are uh, um, go hand in hand, right? Uh, you're probably getting deals because you're validated in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Um, you may not have seen that ultimate conversion, but uh, I, I really think that's grounding to your, uh, some grounding to your ability of, of what you do in, in the marketplace. So uh, I would ultimately challenge that uh, because it may be coming to you and you don't know it, right? Correct. Uh, well, Tony, I appreciate your time coming in, man. I, I learned some stuff. Uh, I'm sure everybody watching learned some, and listening learned some stuff. Uh, I mean, it, I don't think maybe from what people had heard in the beginning, they thought they were going to hear what they were going to hear. But what you shared was was valuable, right? It wasn't that you're doing this trick or that trick in the marketplace to get business. It sounds like um, this is all about the entrepreneur and how you approach business, how you learn from your experiences, uh, and how you care a lot about your business is how you can get it growing on the Inc. 5000 and even past that. So I appreciate it. Everybody, uh, you're going to have Tony's uh, contact information uh, on the podcast, as uh, the audio as well as uh, the video on YouTube. So reach out to him if uh, you need any help with anything. And uh, thanks for joining us on Caesar Business. Thanks for having me, Brian. Cool. Awesome, man. Gracias.